Hi, I'm Professor Afshar at Glendale Community College. This is Physics 101, Lecture 18. In this lecture, we'll discuss Newton's laws of motion. This topic is covered in Chapter 5 of our textbook by Sir Way Andrewet. Perhaps one of the most important figures in all of classical mechanics is the English physicist Isaac Newton. At the foundation of classical mechanics are three laws which today we refer to as Newton's laws of motion. Isaac Newton published these laws uh, in this book, which is probably the most important uh, book in all of physics. Its Latin title is Philosophia Naturalis Principia Mathematica, which translates to Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. Isaac Newton said a lot of things in this book, much of which, frankly, is just wrong. But uh, some of what he said was correct, and uh, most importantly, his three laws of motion turned out to be correct and went on to form the very foundation of classical mechanics. Today, we'll discuss his three laws of motion, starting with the first law. Newton's first law of motion states that an object in motion remains in motion unless acted upon by a force. In more modern terminology, we would state Newton's first law as follows. An object's velocity remains constant unless acted upon by a force. So whatever velocity an object has at one moment in time, it will continue to have that velocity forever and ever unless a force comes in, acts on it, and slows it down or speeds it up or changes its direction. So specifically, Newton is telling us two things. If the object is at rest, so if its velocity is zero, then it will remain at rest until a force acts on it. But he's also telling us if an object is in motion, for example, if it is headed north at 60 miles per hour, then it will maintain that velocity and that heading along a straight line until a force acts on it. So Newton is telling us that for objects that are at rest, they're going to stay at rest, perhaps not very counterintuitive, but he's also telling us that if an object is moving, then it prefers to continue moving along a perfectly straight line with that same exact speed forever, unless a force changes that velocity. Note that Newton's first law of motion essentially has two parts. The first part says if an object is at rest, then it's going to remain at rest. This part is not very counterintuitive. It seems quite obvious. If a piece of paper is at rest on your table and it suddenly flies off the table, you assume that a force must have acted on it. You assume that a breeze was blowing through the window and it exerted a force to move the paper. If a cup is sitting at rest on your table and it suddenly begins to move, you assume that there must have been an earthquake exerting a force and that's why the cup moves. That part of Newton's law of motion, first law of motion, seems obvious. However, the second part is less obvious. The second part states that if an object is in motion already, if it already is moving with some speed in a particular direction, then it will continue to move in that direction forever unless forces act on it. In our daily experience, that seems the opposite of what happens. Objects seem to come to rest without any forces. But in fact, there are forces. In our daily experience, it is friction and air resistance that often cause this behavior. It's difficult to live on planet Earth free of friction and air resistance these forces are constantly acting on objects, but if we were to eliminate these forces and other forces, we would find that objects really do remain in motion until a force acts on them. This motorcycle driver is discovering that fact firsthand. This motorcycle driver was riding his motorcycle with some speed, let's say 60 miles per hour, when his motorcycle crashed into the boundary here. Now, the crash meant that the tires or this boundary here exerts a force on the motorcycle and that force causes the motorcycle to slow down and stop. However, the 
driver of the motorcycle, as you can see in this picture, continues in his state of motion. If he was traveling at 60 miles per hour on the motorcycle, well, he's going to continue to travel at 60 miles per hour on his motorcycle unless a force acts on him. So eventually he will run into the fencing or he will hit the ground um, and eventually he will stop. But in the absence of forces acting on him, then this object or this person, I should say, will continue in its state of motion. To provide some motivation for Newton's first law of motion, we can conduct a thought experiment. Imagine that you have an inclined surface like the one shown here. And imagine that you have a marble that you place at the top of the incline and you allow this marble to roll down the hill. The question is what happens to the speed of the marble as it rolls down? As you might guess, the marble's speed increases as it goes downhill. The force of gravity is acting on the marble, pulling it downwards. So as the marble begins to roll, it will roll faster and faster and faster as it goes downhill. You can even give the marble some push. For example, you might flick it with your fingers, giving it some initial velocity. Whatever that initial velocity is, it will increase as the marble goes downhill. Now you might do the opposite experiment with the same inclined surface. You could put the marble at the bottom of the incline and uh, flick it upwards. So you give it a sudden push, you impart an initial velocity to the marble and you observe it roll uphill. And the question again is what happens to the marble's speed? As you, might case, as you might guess, in this case, the speed is going to decrease. So gravity is still acting on the marble, but this time in the opposite direction. So this time the force of gravity slows down the marble. In either case, we might have friction. However, as we will find out later, friction really doesn't have a significant influence here. Um, we would say that the work performed by friction is negligible. So we're not talking about the marble sliding down. We're talking about the mar marble rolling on a relatively smooth surface. So we could say that really the only force uh, in operation here is the force of gravity. Now we have two extreme scenarios. Uh, the marble is going downhill and speeding up. And in the other scenario, the marble is going uphill and slowing down. So we might ask what happens in an intermediate scenario where we have a flat horizontal surface. And once again, we place the marble and we flick it, we give it some initial speed, and then we watch it roll along on this flat surface. What happens to the speed now? Well, there's still the force of gravity pulling the marble down, but there's also the normal force pushing the marble up, and those two forces cancel each other out. So Newton would say that the net force acting on the marble is zero. Now, just thinking about this logically, if in this case it was speeding up and in this case it was slowing down, then its speed in this intermediate case must remain unchanged. Um, since the left case is a downhill and the right case is an uphill and the intermediate case is neither one, you would logically deduce that the speed of the marble must remain constant, exactly as Newton's first law of motion would imply. Now, this is not really a proof of Newton's first law of motion. In physics, we don't really prove ideas in the same way that mathematicians prove ideas. Uh, the proof of Newton's first law really is in experimentation. Uh, which has been done numerous times both inside and outside of the laboratory for more than a hundred years. In fact, every time you get in your car and you drive somewhere, you're testing Newton's laws of motion. Every time you get in an airplane and you fly somewhere, or every time you use a mechanical device, you're in effect testing and verifying Newton's laws of motion. Next, we want to discuss Newton's second law of motion. However, before discussing the second law, we have to refine our understanding of what mass is. To do that, uh, imagine applying the same force to two different objects. The question is, which moves faster? So imagine that you're pushing two different crates, a small one on the left and a big one on the right, and you apply the same force, let's say 100 Newtons to each crate, 
and you want to know which one will move faster as a result of that force. Clearly, the answer to this question depends on what the crates are made of or what's inside the crates. If the large crate is empty and the small crate is filled with bricks, let's say, then the large crate will move faster. On the other hand, if both crates are, let's say, solid blocks of the same type of wood, then the small crate moves faster. If you think about it, ultimately, the answer really depends on what the mass of the two crates is. To better understand that, we need a precise definition of mass. Fundamentally, mass is a measure of an object's resistance to change in its velocity. Mass is not a measure to is not a measure of resistance to velocity, but a change in velocity. So we can define mass as a measure of an object's resistance to acceleration, because acceleration is effectively a change in velocity. An object that has a lot of mass, an object that is massive, will be very difficult to speed up and it will be very difficult to slow down. If you have a very large truck, for example, it will be very difficult to speed it up and then once it has reached some speed, it will be very difficult to slow it down because it has a lot of mass. On the other hand, an object that has very little mass will be easy to speed up and slow down. Uh, an object with very little mass offers very little resistance to acceleration. It offers very little resistance to changes in its velocity. This fundamental definition of mass is a little bit different than the everyday understanding of mass. We often think of mass as the amount of substance that there is. That definition is fine in many cases, but it's um, difficult to make it precise. How do you define the amount of substance you have? You can measure the volume of an object, but then you know that some substances have a higher density than other substances. So for example, one cubic meter of air has much less mass than one cubic meter of water. You have the same volume there, but clearly one of those things is much heavier. You can also count the number of atoms or molecules, as chemists often do, but there's a problem there too because some atoms are more massive than other atoms. A hundred um, atoms of lead will be more massive than a hundred atoms of aluminum, for example, because individual lead atoms are more massive. So on a very fundamental level, we define mass not as volume or number of molecules, but as an object's resistance to acceleration. This definition is important to you if you're an astronaut in outer space and you want to weigh yourself or if you want to determine your own mass. In the absence of a gravitational field uh, in a microgravity environment, for example, you cannot use an ordinary bathroom scale to weigh yourself. So if you want to know how much you weigh or what is your mass in outer space, you have to use a device like the one shown here. Here, the astronaut is uh, essentially mounting this uh, device. The device is an arm that can extend to the left and to the right. The device exerts a force pulling her to the left and then pushing her back to the right. By measuring the force that is required to move the astronaut, more precisely to accelerate the astronaut, the device calculates her mass. If she's very massive, then it's going to require a large force to accelerate her left and right. If she has very little mass, then it'll be easier and it's going to require a small force. So now we can turn to Newton's second law of motion, which states that the acceleration of an object is equal to the total force on the object divided by its mass. We can express this law as an equation in this form. Acceleration is equal to the net force or the total force divided by mass. The symbol sigma here denotes summation and the implication is that we want to include the total force. So if there are multiple forces, we need to sum them, we need to add them together to find the total force and then divide by mass to find the acceleration. This equation is also sometimes written like so. The two equations are identical mathematically. Um, on the left, I'm using sigma f to denote the total force. On the right, I'm using f net, as in the net force. But the important thing is 
that it is the total force or the summation of forces that appears in this equation, not just a single force. People often quote Newton's second law of motion as F equals MA, and then they forget that the F is actually the total of all forces acting on the object. Although the two equations here are mathematically equivalent, the one on the left is more practical. In other words, in more uh, in the in the practical applications of Newton's second law, what you're often uh, what you're often interested in is in calculating the acceleration. So you often start actual practical problems by figuring out the forces and then adding those forces together to find the total force and then dividing by mass to find the acceleration. So Newton's second law is really a tool uh, for calculating the acceleration of objects. And then of course you should remember from your study of kinematics that once you have figured out the acceleration, you can then proceed to figure out the velocity and position and the entire motion of an object. Remind yourself that in using Newton's second law, it must be the total force that, it, um, that is used. In other words, you must first figure out all the forces and then add them together before you start plugging numbers into this equation. Also note that according to this equation, if the total force is zero, then the acceleration will be zero. So the object will not accelerate or the object will not change its velocity if there is no net force. This in some sense is basically a restatement of the first law of motion that tells us an object moving with some velocity will continue to move with that velocity unless a force acts on it. Also remember that an object can move with constant velocity even if the total force is zero. Forces are really required to accelerate objects, to speed them up or slow them down, but if an object has already accelerated and it is moving with some velocity, it can maintain that velocity forever um, without the presence of any kind of a force. It just can't accelerate without forces. Let's do a practice problem using Newton's second law of motion. A person is pushing a crate with a mass of 50 kilograms. He applies a force of 75 Newtons to the right. The force of friction on the crate is 65 Newtons to the left. What is the speed of the crate after three seconds? So this person is pushing the crate. The crate is sitting on the floor. There is some friction there. Um, in this problem, the friction is given to us. We're told that he's pushing the crate to the right and friction, of course, as usual, is resisting the object's motion. And so friction points to the left with a magnitude of 65 Newtons. Notice that the force of the person is greater than the force of friction. And so this crate will definitely move. In fact, it will accelerate and it will go faster and faster Assuming that it starts at rest, we want to know what is the speed of the crate after three seconds. To solve a problem like this, it's advisable to start with a force diagram. So we reduce the object of interest, the crate, to a single point, And we begin by figuring out the forces that are acting on this object. Probably the easiest one to calculate is the weight of the object. Remember that weight is simply... Uh, mg, so it's the mass of the object times gravitational acceleration. So in this case, the weight turns out to be 490 newtons. We're calculating that by taking the mass, which is 50 kilograms, and multiplying it by gravitational acceleration on Earth, which is 9.8. Here I'm writing the magnitude of weight as 490. If you wanted to, you could write uh, weight as a vector, in which case you would write it as 0, comma, minus 490. In addition to weight, there is also the normal force. Remember, this crate is in contact with the floor, so there must be some contact forces there. The normal force points up. Remember that the normal force is a reactive force. It reacts to other perpendicular forces. In this case, it only reacts to weight. Since weight is pulling the crate down with a magnitude of 490, the normal force will resist that. The normal force will push up with a magnitude of 490 newtons. 
In addition to these two forces, there's also the force of the person, which is given to us as 75 newtons pointing to the right. And of course, there's the force of friction pointing to the left with a magnitude of 65 newtons. Here again, I've written the magnitudes of all these forces, but we could write each one of them as a vector. For example, the force of friction could be expressed as minus 65 in the x direction, comma, zero. Now that we know what the individual forces are, we can calculate the total force. Remember, to use Newton's second law of motion, you need the net force or the total force or the sum of all forces. In this particular case, you can see easily that the normal force will cancel weight, so those two forces add up to zero, and when we add up the uh, force of the person and the force of friction, we find that the net force or the total force is 10 newtons to the right. Here I'm giving you again the magnitude of the force, but if we wanted to, we could say something like the net force as a vector is equal to uh, 10 comma zero, as in zero newtons in the y direction and 10 newtons in the positive x direction or to the right. Now that we have the total force, we can use Newton's second law of motion to calculate the acceleration. According to Mr. Newton's second law of motion, acceleration is the total force divided by the mass, so 10 divided by 50. And that gives us an acceleration of 0 0.2 meters per second squared. Now the question asks for the speed of the crate. Here we have found the acceleration. We can see that the acceleration is a constant. It's a fixed number. This prompts us to use the kinematic equations from chapters 2 and 4. Looking at the kinematics equations, we see that this equation is going to be useful to us. V final is equal to V initial plus AT. In this problem, we're going to assume that the crate starts at rest, so V initial is zero, the acceleration is 0.2, and the time of interest is three seconds. That's given to us in the problem. Plugging those numbers in, we find that the final velocity or speed of the crate will be 0 0.6 meters per second. Next, we want to discuss Newton's third law of motion. But before doing that, remember that a force, any kind of a force, always involves two objects. So there's always the interaction of two objects that results in a force. One of the objects exerts the force. The other object experiences the force. So you can think of one object as pushing and the other object as being pushed. We sometimes express this by writing forces in this form where we talk about the force of object A on object B. Sometimes we forget to write forces like this or we find it uh, too cumbersome to write forces like this, but that idea is always there. If you're talking about the force of gravity, for example, on a falling apple, what you're really talking about is the force of planet Earth on the apple. So Earth is object A and the apple is object B. If you have tied a rope, for example, to a box and you're pulling that rope, then we call that force tension. But in that case, tension is really the force of the rope on the box. If you are talking about friction, for example, between the box and the floor as it slides across the floor, then you're really talking about the force of the floor atoms on the box atoms. So we don't always specify the two objects that are involved in the interaction, but you should remember that forces do always involve two objects. Having said that, we can now state Newton's third law of motion as follows. The force of object A on object B is equal in magnitude to the force of B on A, but opposite in direction. We can express the third law mathematically in this form. Force of A on B is equal to the negative of force of B on A. Remember that when you take a vector and you multiply it by minus 1, you're not changing the magnitude of that vector, you're only changing the direction of the vector. Specifically, you're flipping its direction by 180 degrees.
So when you put a minus sign in front of a vector, like in front of this force vector, you're basically changing the direction by 180 degrees without changing the magnitude. So the magnitude of the force of A on B is equal to the magnitude of the force of B on A, but the two forces point in opposite directions. This law also implies that whenever one object exerts on another object, the other object exerts a force back. This is not always obvious. You might imagine, for example, pushing a crate across the floor. As you exert a force on the crate, does the crate exert a force back on you? The answer is yes. The third law definitively says that whenever an object A exerts a force on B, the reverse also happens. Object B exerts a force on A simply in the opposite direction. These two forces pushing um, in opposite directions are often referred to as an action-reaction pair. So Newton's third law is sometimes stated as for every action, there's an equal but opposite reaction. The action and the reaction are simply applying to these forces. However, to really use this law in practice, you have to pay attention to the subscripts and make sure that they follow the pattern established in this equation. When using Newton's third law of motion in actual problems, it's always a good idea to start with a force diagram. And in drawing the force diagram, you have to be very careful in how you label the forces and where you draw them. This is um, especially important if you're dealing with situations where you have more than two objects interacting. As an example, imagine we are discussing the physics of the solar system, and we want to discuss the force that the sun exerts on the earth, but at the same time, we want to discuss the force that the earth exerts on the moon. There are multiple forces involved in this situation. If we want to understand the dynamics, the motion, of these three objects, we need to begin by examining the forces. So on the one hand, the sun is pulling on the earth. That's the force of sun on earth. So this vector represents the gravitational pull of the sun on earth. But of course, at the same time, the earth is pulling on the sun and we represent that using this vector. Notice that this is a force acting on the sun, so I have drawn the vector on the sun, and I have labeled it as the force of Earth on sun. These two forces are an action-reaction pair. They are equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. And you can see that they follow the pattern established in Newton's third law equation. We have E on S and S on E. Of course, at the same time, the Earth and the Moon are also interacting. So the Earth is pulling on the Moon. That's this vector here. That's the force of Earth on the Moon. And at the same time, according to Newton's second law of motion, the Moon is pulling on the Earth. We label that force as the force of Moon on Earth, and we draw that force on Earth. Of course, you can say that the sun and the moon are also interacting. The force, the gravitational force of the sun on the moon is labeled as force of S on M, and that vector is drawn on the moon. This other vector represents the force of the moon on the sun, and I'm drawing this vector on the sun, right? So all the forces that are acting on the sun are drawn on the picture of the sun, all the forces that are acting on Earth are drawn on the picture of Earth, and all the forces that are acting on the Moon are drawn on the picture or the dot representing the Moon. Drawing your force diagrams in this way is extremely important because it helps you calculate the net force and it also helps you identify the action-reaction pairs. For example, this force and this force can now easily be identified as an action-reaction pair. You can see they point in opposite directions. And if you look at the indices, you'll see this one is E on M, and this one is exactly the opposite, M on E. Let's end this lecture with a review of Newton's laws of motion.
The first law states that an object's velocity remains constant, so it does not change, unless acted upon by a force. So in the absence of forces, there is no acceleration, the velocity remains constant. In the presence of forces, the velocity can change, there can be acceleration. The second law says the acceleration of an object is equal to the total force on the object divided by its mass. So once we know there are forces acting on an object, then we know there's going to be a change in velocity, we know there's going to be an acceleration, and the second law enables us to actually calculate that acceleration. Just remember that you must first figure out the individual forces and add them together to find the net force before using the second law of motion. The third law says that the force of A on B is equal in magnitude to the force of B on A, but in opposite directions. So if person A is pushing on person B, then person B will push back on person A with exactly the same magnitude. Of course, in a situation like this, you might be wondering, well, how does anything ever move? Certainly some people are stronger than other people. How does that come about? We'll discuss that type of a scenario in our next lecture. Looking at these three laws, you should probably notice that they're relatively easy to state and memorize. However, actually using Newton's laws of motion in practical real world situations is quite tricky and requires lots of practice. So in our next lecture, we'll turn to actually using Newton's laws of motion uh, in solving practical problems. And that's the end of this lecture. Thank you for your attention.